You know, think about Live Oak. You know, they took our building over there in Woodrow. They've been, they've been uh, in business for 10, 15 years, never had a building. They just went from rented space to rented space, and they were in a school, and then they were going to shut that school down, and it started to get a little uh, uncomfortable. And they said, you know what? We've, we've kind of been vagrants all this time. We need a permanent identity, a permanent location. So we're not at the whims of school shutting down and things like that. And uh, again, God uh, provided for that. Now, one word of caution. You might be aware of this. There's a movement afoot. It's been going on for recent years uh, called the Home Church Movement. And they're very organized. They've got magazines. Uh, some of them are published here in Austin. Um, they've got uh, different publications, different radio features, different books, uh, stressing home churches as opposed to what they call, well, they've got different names for it. Some of them are kind of insulting, which bothers me. Uh, uh, they, would, they would call us something else because we have a, a building here. We would be formal, okay? I don't think we're that formal, but that's what they would call us. Now, what I want to give you is a word of caution. A church does not need a building to be a church, but a church does need a pastor to be a flock. You understand that? Without a pastor, they are sheep without a shepherd. And there is an underlying, and I've seen it every single time, underlying the home church movement, and it's in their publications, and so they put it in writing. They are very, they are hostile what they call structured church, formal church, authority. They don't want to have a one-man point of a, uh, responsibility as a pastor. They, it's a kind of a communism thing with fellowship, and every man is welcome to, on an equal basis, to open up the scriptures and, and so forth. All right? And don't get me wrong. If you want to have a Bible fellowship in your home, wonderful. But don't confuse it with a local church. Let's understand our ecclesiology. Let's understand that a flock requires a shepherd. And so that's just a word of caution. And some of the books are out there, and some of the magazines are published right here in this town. And uh, even uh, one of the more prominent ones actually has an editor that used to be uh, associated with this church years ago. So you might be exposed to some of that, and if you are, I just want your eyes open to it so you'll see it for what it is. All right. Second principle. If I don't keep moving, then I won't get done this hour. <laughs> A local church does not need to incorporate as a 501c3. In fact, many of them are not. A church does not need to incorporate as a nonprofit corporation to be a local church. We were discussing this on Wednesday. What does it take to obtain the tax exempt status? What does it take to, uh, you know, and there, there are different procedures involved. If Jesus Christ provides such an administrative mechanism, then the principle of use, use, I'm sorry, but not full use, applies. And this was a principle we learned in our First Corinthians series, First Corinthians 7. We can take a look at that. Again, we've got to recognize there is a mechanism that we're allowed to do. And that mechanism, if we incorporate, if we file, there are pastors, there are believers who won't, who won't incorporate and they won't file. They view that as submitting to Caesar. Or they view that as improper in their conscience. And I'm not going to criti be critical of a believer who's going to live their con uh, conscience. But I think that we can be relaxed in certain areas under the principle of use but not full use. If we understand that there are mechanisms at work. See, I notice these same people, they stop at red lights. Why do they stop at red lights? Why do they go at green lights? They, they seem to have no issue with the red light, green light, governmental uh, authority rendering unto Caesar. Okay. Uh, they, they probably use U.S. currency for their modem of, uh, medium of exchange. If in the laws of our land, in the laws of the state of Texas, we are permitted to file a piece of paper and become a legal entity, to become a church, then it is a provision that we can, I think, in uh, grace and in faith, we can do so. And this allows us all kinds of things. We're, we're, we can own title to property. We can have a bank account. We can have a... a uh, we can interact with businesses. We can contract for utilities. We can have lights on in here. <laughs> right? Um, at some point, we, we, I understand we're aliens and strangers, and this world is not our home, but we have to interface with this world. <coughs> At some level. And so I believe this is the mechanism. And like I say, they don't have this in the Philippines. or There's different structures in different countries and different localities. So let's understand it. What's the principle? 
And we taught this in 1 Corinthians 7, and I think it's, it's uh, valid for a variety of different con uh, contexts. This is strictly, it's a, it's a marriage and divorce chapter, but there's a principle here that I think we can glean. It says in verse 29, This I say, brethren, the time has been shortened, so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess. And you say, well, what's wrong with all these things? I have a wife. Should I neglect her? Um, I have a, uh, you know, I work, and I have, I have what's wrong with rejoicing? And, and uh, can I buy food? What, what's wrong with buying? Okay. And if you remember, when we taught this, we put this in the context of what we're looking forward to when we get to heaven. Remember, it's in heaven that we're no longer marrying or giving in marriage. It's in heaven that uh, a lot of these, we're not going to be any more weeping. See, it's in heaven that all of the things that we associate with here that have center stage, let's get them off center stage. Let's be heavenly minded, knowing that the time is short. And so it says, uh, those who buy as though they did not possess. You know, realize, okay, I purchased this, but it's not really mine. And if God wants to take it away tomorrow, he's free to do that. Okay, I don't want to be attached to my possessions in the, in the recognition that I have ownership. I only have ownership because he's, in grace, permitted me to have ownership. The, the money that purchased it was also a grace provision. And the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I don't want to be so attached to something that I'd say is mine. Nothing is mine. I'm not even mine. Because I've been bought with a price. And so I think the explanation then unfolds it in the next verse, in verse 31... Those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it. That's the difference. And I think this gives us our balance. Use but not full use. This gives us our balance. This lets us have a relaxed mental attitude about certain things where we, we put things in proper perspective and we don't worry about the rest of it. Those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it for the form of this world is passing away. And so, um, as it relates to how we interface with the government, how we interface with the community, how we contract for utilities, and how we exist, we're making use of the world. But we're not making full use. We're not going to uh, pursue certain business practices, for example, that would be very common, but uh, we don't find them to be biblical, honorable, or uh, righteous in any way. You understand? So we use, but we aren't following the full use, if you understand. Certain things that we're just not going to do. Do I need to illustrate that? Is that catching on? Okay. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, this allows us to relax a little bit. I've known uh, believers that have struggled relaxing over certain things. And they get really worked up over where they spend their money and what they do. And I, and I to a point, I appreciate what they do. And I admire the fact that they want to have a life that's compatible with their faith. And so they are very choosy on where they spend their money. And they only purchase, for example, gasoline at certain outlets, and they won't purchase at other outlets. And they only buy books in certain stores, they won't buy books in other stores. And they only bank in certain places, they won't bank in these other places. Okay? And I think, so far as that goes, you can do so in faith for the glory of Jesus Christ. But I think you can also do so for the wrong reasons, at which point it's no longer by faith and it's no longer for the glory of Jesus Christ. It becomes an issue of legalism where you're using it as a benchmark for how holy you are and how crummy the other guy is because he's not as good as you are in, uh, in the stores he shops at and doesn't shop at. See. So... I use bookstores a lot because, for illustration because that's where most of my money goes. Um, but there are people that would have objections against Barnes & Noble for social, political, whatever kind of reason. Or they would have things against Amazon. Or they would have, re you know, whatever. And then, or they would prefer Christian book distributors. Say, they say, well, I want to support Christian book distributors. That's great. You're free to do that. And I believe believers can do opposite choices. Both do so for the glory of Jesus Christ. Both for the right reasons. And a believer can, maybe he spends 20 bucks at christianbook.com. But he wants to. To support a Christian ministry. To support 
what he believes in. And, and, he, and so he pays a little bit extra by doing that. And he does so in faith, and he thanks the Father. He says, Father, thank you. I have 20 bucks today, and I can buy this book, and so forth. Uh, but somebody else finds it on Amazon for 18 And he buys it on Amazon and says, Father, I thank you. I just saved $2. Okay? As a steward, I now have uh, other uh, things I can do with that $2. And, and you understand the, the, uh, the difference. Two believers can come to opposite decisions, both for the right reasons. And that's what we want to stress. The motivation behind what you do. And I think when if we really got worked up over certain things, and, and one fellow in particular, I, I don't think I ever was able to communicate with him. But he, he was um, absolutely um, caught up in certain things about stores and banks and different things. And, and so then I asked him, I said, well, these banks on your approval list, and these other banks on your non-approval list, these banks on your approval list, who are they banking with? Who are they doing their business with? See, because they're all connected. Every last one. One of them is interconnected. All right? And uh, go over to a verse and show and say, you know what? You, what does it say right here? The whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. It's a fallen world we live in. So maybe we can learn to simply make use of the world, but not full use of it, and then leave all the rest in the hands of Jesus Christ and, and allow him to do the work. I think that's a, that's a better approach. All right, third observation. An omni-gifted, dispensationally oriented congregation. That was Corinth, and I believe that's us. An omni-gifted, dispensationally oriented congregation has a corresponding wide door. A wide door for effective ministry. 